Um, so welcome everybody. It's six o'clock Thursday, which means Thursday Garden Chat. I know it's not six o'clock for all of you, but um, welcome to everybody who's further afield. I can see sunshine um, coming in people's, um, people's windows. Um, so before we get on to the main event of the evening, just a few things to mention um, coming up. Obviously, um, we have already on the website got some live events uh, up for uh, 2024. Uh, and remember, we're giving a discount on live events to members as, as well this year. That's a slight new thing, which is exciting. Um, and then we've got some more live events coming up on the website or will be coming out in a newsletter at the end of the month, beginning of February, with some really, really exciting stuff that we're working on. And we're really can't wait to tell you all about that. Um, but back to online webinars, um, 30th of January, we've got Chris Fell Harbour from uh, the wonderful Chanticleer Gardens talking about spring. So those of you who need a little bit of um, excitement and to think ahead to spring, um, what a lovely place to go. 7th of February, we've got um, Philip from uh, Newwood Trees in Devon talking about uh, multi-stem trees. Now, Newwood Trees is a lovely nursery just in from the coast near Totnes in Devon, which is a beautiful county, and they specialise in field-grown multi-stem trees. Multi-stem trees have become really, really popular um, for, for good reason, really, They're just and, and shrubs, you know, large shrubs, small trees. Um, so Philip's going to talk about selecting multi-stem and how to care for and manage and prune them. So a really interesting um, to, uh, webinar for designers and for um, gardeners alike and horticulturalists. I've used that term to, to really annoy somebody who's... I doesn't like the term of horticulturalist. Um, Are we mentioning uh, any names? No, no, I'm not, but he hosts a gardening programme. Um, right, so <laughs> then bad botany. Um, now, bad botany is a great term. Um, I've rather stupidly said I'd try and organise some T-shirts for this, which I've got to try and do. Um, is a wonderful series, of course, uh, of a series of lectures with the amazing Caroline Jackson. If you've never heard Caroline, Jackson then um, you haven't lived she's an incredible horticulturalist and very knowledgeable we've already had one session we've got two more to go um, now for those of you who think oh I've missed the boat we've opened the doors again so you can come back into Bad Botany and, and see the first session and catch up on the next two um, it, we've called it Bad Botany slightly tongue-in-cheek but it's about the botany that you need to know, you know, what what can you it's it's you know, what what can you get away with? And and actually Caroline is so wonderfully uh, in depth about her her botanical knowledge, but also imparts it with such ease. It's fantastic. And the next session is about conifers, which I'm really looking forward to, because I think for many years, people like me have turned their noses up at conifers. And I think it's time to think again. Um, and then the, the last one I want to talk about in this little run is Claire Greenslade, who um, is the head gardener at Hestercombe in Somerset. Um, those of you that went to our conference at Chatsworth last year will have heard Claire talking with uh, Katie Merrington and uh, Lizzie Bamforth, <clears throat> all wonderful women head gardeners. Claire is going to be talking about gardening and gardens as an art form and landscape as an art form um and so uh, that will be a very interesting one and uh, another one i want to plug that's a little bit further down the line but i but but you know i think people are not sure about is um we have a webinar with uh, the, the guys from far reaches nursery up, up on the west west uh, on puget sound now some of you might be thinking this isn't relevant because they're in puget sound and i live in bognor regis well it really is relevant because a their climate is very similar to ours in rainy old Britain, but also I've been to the nursery and I can honestly say it is the most extraordinary collection of plants. We've had them on um, Thursday Garden Chat. They're a lovely couple, um, lots of fun, but very very knowledgeable. They go plant hunting. Everything in their nursery is just extraordinary and, and when I was walking around with Kelly and Sue he'd pick up a plant and go this is interesting and after about 45 minutes I said Kelly everything's interesting you don't have to keep saying that so so have a look at that it's it's one that's coming up um, a little bit further down the line with far reaches it's about shade loving plants isn't it Noel? Uh, is it basically yeah, woodland yeah. woodland oh, yeah. and shade lovers which um, we can all have lots of fun with so 
have a look at the webinars um, that, are, that are coming, stretching out ahead of you. Have, have a look at the live events that we've already got planned and brace yourself for the next uh, announcement for the live events coming up because they're really exciting and I don't want to drop any hints. Anyway, tonight we've got um, this extraordinary plantsman, <laughs> garden writer um, and bon viveur, uh, Mr. No, not Mr. Dr. Noel Kingsbury. <laughs> he's he's rather new to Garden Masterclass and he's a little bit shy, so do be kind to him. Hello, Noel. Okay. Thank you, Annie. Thanks for that. <laughs> Interested you call me a bon viveur. <laughs> I can, I can be taken the wrong way, actually. <laughs> well, I don't mind. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> um, no, I, I hope um, you don't want any money. That's all I'm saying now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just under 30 years ago, my our dear colleague, Brita von Schoenach, uh, who was a landscape architect and a teacher on the horticulture course at Kew, uh, organized a conference at Kew um, called Perennial Perspectives. Uh, and it was the first of a run of conferences, there's about five or six of them, that very much introduced the those practicing what we've come to call ecological or naturalistic planting to each other. It certainly introduced uh, some German and Dutch practitioners to, to Britain, which desperately needed an input of fresh ideas uh, at that time in the mid 90s. Um, and uh, it was a became a great sort of a great melting pot over the next few years. Um, since then, we've come on a long way. I mean, I think uh, in many ways we've made great strides. So when I was asked to do a the keynote presentation at the Dynamic Landscape Conference um, in Germany last summer, uh, I thought, well, this is a great opportunity to sort of to just kind of reflect on what we've done, but more importantly, to actually look forward um, to what the, 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 the future agenda should be for ecological planting design. So really, that's what this presentation is. Um, the Dynamic Landscape Conference was attached to the Bundesgarten Shower, very much organised by Bettina Jaugstetter and uh, Anna-Lena Hahn, um, in conjunction with the um, German Professional Gardeners Association. Um, so, um, without more ado, I'll go to my keynote um, and share screen. There it is. Um, and I called it uh, "New Nature for a Climate Change for a Climate Change Future" because, uh, for me, and I think for many of us. Uh, climate change is going to be really the great issue of, of the future and uh, all aspects of human activity will have to ad adapt to it. Um, now, I've, um, I can get the slides to move forward. For some reason, they will. Um, many of the images are from this book, Wild, uh, shot by Claire Takash. This book came out in March uh, 2022, and uh, it's lovely to be, it's fantastic to be able to work with uh, such a, a great um, and dedicated photographer. Um, so uh, what I want to do is make the case for dynamic, truly ecological planting, uh, address the issue of climate change. Uh, I'd like to look a little bit at new professional directions uh, that will make this kind of planting actually work in the future. Um, I'd like to reflect a little on the aesthetics of planting, you know, what we know, what we've learned over the last couple of decades, but also what we need to learn. Um, I'd like us to reorientate some of our thinking, perhaps, uh, towards looking at a wider range of plant forms, particularly at how we've rather neglected woody plants over the last couple of decades. Um, and stressing that what we, we need to learn about plants both above, but also, I would stress, below ground. So first of all, climate change. Uh, Looking at possible, well, almost certainly now probable impacts, we're going to be looking at a lot of coastal flooding um, and the salt infiltration of coastal soils, which will result in a lot of migration, but also, crucially, in the loss of a lot of high-quality agricultural land. 
uh, inevitably, uh, this movement of people, and it could be an enormous movement of people uh, and uh, farmland, will result in a lot of new urbanisation, inevitably, and I'm afraid inevitably, it will be a lot of favela, sh shanty towns type uh, developments. Uh, but it is the displacement of agriculture that hasn't attracted nearly enough media attention uh, as perhaps it should have done. The result, I'm afraid, is that there's going to be dramatically less space for nature, that a lot of nat nat nature reserves and national parks, areas that at the moment are under some sort of protection, are going to be under, th uh, un under huge pressure for agricultural, for agriculture and agricultural intensification. Agriculture has been the greatest destroyer of natural landscapes and natural ecosystems throughout history. Uh, if you want to read up more on that, I thoroughly recommend uh, the British ecological writer George Monbiot's latest book, um, Regenesis, which takes a really very refreshingly radical look at this. So with less room for nature, uh, I believe that a, a, a moral priority for our profession should be creating space for nature in urban areas, seeking to integrate human and biodiversity habitat. And that is perhaps one of the most important things that our planting movement over the last 30 years has been looking at and being able to begin to do successfully. We need to be really focusing on high density planting so much of the amenity planting or, or garden planting is actually pretty low density. Uh, and, and basically, the, the, the higher the, the density, the better for biodiversity that's going to be. Uh, inevitably, a lot of this new nature in urban areas is going to be about environmental amelioration, sustainable drainage schemes, uh, planting for air quality, shade and heat reduction. Uh, all those things, all those environmental services that plants are able to deliver. But crucially, all these developments should take into account the conservation of plant and animal species, because in many cases, species of animal and plant will only survive in the habitats that we create for them. So this is the great moral imperative. It's, it's thinking about you know, how can we create spaces for nature that integrate and indeed serve our, our needs in urban and peri-urban environments, but would also carry out a conservation function. Uh, what I call the curse of Annabelle, um, planting that serves no biodiversity value whatsoever. Uh, um, and the, Annabelle, I think, is the most egregious example of a particular kind of uh, mass-produced plant that in, in many ways could more or less be, be plastic. Um, but first of all, I'd like to sort of folk drill down a bit on about these definitions. Uh, you know, we talk about naturalistic, we talk about ecological planting. I'd like he, here to sort of really put them at the two ends of a, of a, of a, of a spectrum to sort of really clarify what I mean about uh, planting for ecology. Naturalistic planting is, is really about a visual, a, a visual appearance that's focused on you know, our expectations, our interests, you know, what we find attractive. Um, it's an, but nevertheless an aesthetic that's very much inspired by wild plant communities, which is what has set it, which is what it set, has set it apart from uh, previous uh, planting styles. Uh, but there's far, far more we should be looking at than simply aesthetics. By ecological planting, I mean creating plantings that have the, the density of natural plant communities that actually can have ecological process, life and death and natural regeneration and room for spontaneous addition of species. And uh, inevitably, that means species that will... Uh, become part of that community and, and not uh, overwhelm it. Um, and we should be looking at planting that has a value to wildlife that is equivalent to so-called natural vegetation. Uh, one practitioner who has succeeded, I think, very well in bringing together the aesthetic and the genuinely ecological, um, Larry Weiner here at a garden in Connecticut, uh, with a a, a prairie mix with the density of, of, of a wild prairie grassland, 
um, but which has this aesthetic skew uh, towards particular color and, and, and height combinations. Uh, of course, the ability to do this is going to vary considerably uh, depending on the, the locally available species. Um, which, and, and, and a topic that uh, Larry always brings up is, are we talking about maintenance or management? And one of the issues that we, uh, I think, really talked about a lot at that conference in, 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 in Germany was really wanting to talk about management rather than maintenance. Maintenance implying uh, housework, keeping something always the same. Management as a more active process of, of seeing the uh, the plant community as a, as, a, as an active partner um, and managing its direction rather than continually bringing it back to an original design conception. So continuing to look at making this distinction between this 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 spectrum, this this gradient of planting styles. Uh, with the aesthetically driven on one side and the strictly ecological on the other. Basically, uh, more ecological plantings have higher density and more competition, therefore more ecological process. But for many of us, it's that area in the middle where there is a, a clear design function where aesthetics have been thought about, but nevertheless, uh, which is genuinely ecological and dynamic. This is the territory that I think a lot of us find uh, the most interesting. Uh, places like um, Hermannshof here with um, these fantastic plant combinations that uh, definitely do change uh, over time um, and potentially have a huge biodiversity value. Uh, as we go from the aesthetics first, naturalistic to the generally ecological. There's more ecological process, plant density, and therefore value to biodiversity builds up. There's a greater spatial and structural complexity. And in many cases, uh, I would argue that there's greater resistance to invasive species. The more species dense a, veg a, plant, a plant community is, and that applies to natural plant communities as much as created ones, the more species, the more uh, spaces uh, that are filled by by, by plants, um, the, the 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 greater the, res the resistance to uh, to invasive species. Um, in terms of maintenance, uh, strictly ecological planting uh, can be very often managed with extensive management. It simply requires less time. However, that time needs to be skilled time or at least at least it needs to be directed by uh, those with appropriate skills and and knowledge and so there is this trade-off that that a lot of naturalistic planting in this more towards the conventional end of the spectrum a lot of this can be managed with the sort of conventional skills that um uh fairly fairly low skills a more ecological des design does need a, a, a greater input um of 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 a, of a particular uh, of a particular eye, um, although actually less less time. And currently, uh, ecological plantings are very much in most places concerned almost overwhelmingly uh, with native species. And those of us in in Europe, perhaps uh, unusual in that we, uh, for all sorts of historical reasons, are much more open to using non-native species in genuinely ecological plantings. But I will argue that with climate change and the change in, in range of many plant species, that is something that we're going to have to uh, to, to look at more critically. Uh, I'm indeed arguing that um, uh, in many cases, because of uh, new um, um, what are called novel novel ecosystems, ecosystems that combine uh, introduced species and native species, in many places we may be looking at a, a new nature. Um, conventional planting is implemented, established. And the intended planting should reflect what was in the eye of the designer. Um, and this process is managed by the horticulturalist, the gardener. In ecological planting, um, there's a greater there's a greater dynamism that various outcomes are possible depending on that management process. 
So the guard manager has a much greater say in uh, deciding those outcomes. So a greater need for uh, a greater need for, for certainly for, for plant knowledge and knowledge and awareness of ecological systems. Crucially, decisions made in the early years may preclude certain possible paths of development. For example, if a particularly strongly spreading species is allowed to spread too much in the first couple of years, that may almost eliminate certain other species. Uh, so in other words, management of a planting is actually an ongoing design process that every act of, of management of, of, of planting or seed head removal or uh, editing out seedlings is actually a design decision because it has Im it has implications uh, for the plant combinations in future years. So ecological pro ecological horticulture then is the managing of a process, uh, not about achieving an end result. So it's a journey with many possible destinations. Oh, indeed, no destination at all. Perhaps we should stop thinking about an end result and actually uh, see continually changing dynamic plantings as uh, as uh, as for, for what they are at that particular moment in time. Well, maybe the journey is the destination. Sorry if that's all getting a little bit zen, but it's uh, just wanting us all to think differently about you know, what we mean by maintenance and management. Crucially, this means that uh, are management staff horticulturalists or ecologists, or are they something, a, a, a profession that actually brings the, these two skill sets and awarenesses and knowledge bases together? And I would argue very much that we need a new profession that, um, that achieves this. Uh, we need people who can manage and, 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 and create and, and, and work creatively with seeding, vegetative spread, the death of short-lived species, the arrival of spontaneous species, uh, the loss of diversity and how that might be reversed. Um, so we're looking a lot at uh, extensive management, uh, cutting, burning, occasional ground disturbance, um, and um, dare I say it, um, uh, chemical at times chemical control. Um, and it's difficult to have an adult conversation sometimes about the use of herbicides, but particularly when dealing either with a public space where resources for management are very limited um, or invasive aliens, it's something that I think we do have to consider. Um, just to throw in an example of a garden which um, you know, Annie and I are both extremely fond of and we've committed quite a lot to, uh, to, to filming, um, Wildside in Devon, is an extraordinary example of a very, very aesthetically driven garden um, created by uh, a, a, a couple, um, and, and Keith Wiley is somebody with you know, enormous artistic vision, but where there is an enormous amount of ecological process happening. Uh, my visit there last summer, I was absolutely fascinated to be seeing these extraordinarily species dense and physically dense plantings with you know just so much self-seeding going on i mean here we've got purple linaria trionothophora uh with you know a host of other species and this does seem to be you know, a, a a wonderful example of what is possible um although needing uh actually uh pretty skilled direction every now and again in terms of what what gets weeded out um arguably it's the conjunction of a particular set of environmental circumstances but more crucially it's bringing an awful lot of plants together uh, and uh, allowing a certain amount of uh, allowing and managing um, that that self-seeding um now moving on to aesthetics um I and mean, here we inevitably we have to mention pete aldolf um who whose vision is I would stress very, very much um, an artistic one. Um, 
in a way, it's somewhat unfortunate, perhaps, that, that, that peat was taken on as this kind of poster boy for ecological planting, um, because his planting is, is not ecologically based. It is very much uh, about a particular artistic vision. Um, and I th what I think we've learned from peat, we've learned a lot of lessons about, particularly about plant form and structure and about looking at plants outside that high performance flowering season. Um, and we've learned a, a language from him that I think has been hugely useful um, and is one and is a language that can be applied uh, to many different situations, many different environments, many different floras and many different ways of putting plants together, you know, not just the out of way. Um, that language of spikes and plumes and buttons and umbels. Um, one of the uh, pleasures over the last few years has been teaching a course for learning with experts uh, where we introduce students to uh, looking at plants the, uh, the out of way and getting back what people are looking at in terms of their own local flora. Um, and one of the most wonderful being... Um, uh, brought to us by a group of students by Mariana Siqueira from uh, southern Brazil, looking using their incredible savanna grassland um, flora. Uh, in looking at uh, a lot of contemporary planting with perennials, to put it bluntly, a lot of peat out of knockoffs, no one else can quite kind of get it right. Uh, you see plantings that um, you know, they're fantastic plantings, but they just don't quite, they just don't quite do it somehow. It's extremely difficult to actually say, you know, why? What is going on here that is not giving us quite the uh, wow factor that an out of planting gives us? And I think this comes down to a, a language of spatial distribution. Now, if somebody, uh, any PA, any potential PhD students out there who are interested in planting and are interested in, in aesthetics can handle a certain amount of statistics, this would be a very interesting topic to do your thesis on. Um, starting with that, uh, the, the, the great Rion Anji garden in Kyoto in Japan, uh, which has had this kind of mathematical analysis, um, concluding that in fact, the reason we all love Rion Anji is that uh, it, it very, very subconsciously brings forward into our minds the shape uh, of, 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 a, of a branch of a, of, of a tree uh, going into, into branches. Um, because if you create a model of Iranji and you move the stones around, or just even move one stone and you show it to people, people somehow find it less, less satisfying. So in other words, there, there's a there's a, a mathematics, a statistics of distributions of plants in a planting that we really need to, to investigate and, and to learn from. Having said that though, uh, peat remains very wedded to this, this block planting, which we see here at, at Hauser and Worth in Southwest England. Um, and most of us have really moved on beyond this when most of the interesting work being done with planting design now is, is, is moved well on from this block planting. It's looking very much um, at intermingling plants, at creating, you know, much more genuinely uh, nature-like, uh, much more genuinely ecological uh, planting mixes. But nevertheless, this fundamental design language is, is still one that is, I think, going to prove very useful. Um, it's a it's a design language that I think has been taken a stage further by by Nigel Dunnett, who's got a you know very fine eye for. Uh, this distribution of plants across space, um, the Barbican in London, uh, it's a podium planting, uh, 45 centimetres of fairly low fertility substrate um, over, um, over car parking, I, I suppose, certainly on, on a solid um, green roof. And I think what's interesting about this is the amount of regeneration of the components that you see as you move around the edge. Uh, we've got Armeria and Oenothera and Euphorbia and Sedum all here seeding from the planting mix. Um, and I went to, in London, I was in London over the summer, got horribly lost in the Barbican complex, which is the most amazing kind of, you know, dystopian urban jungle in some ways. Eventually I found 
the the Nigel Dunnett plantings, um, and they had hadn't for various reasons had not had a gardener for the past year. So I was really very surprised to see just how good they were looking at how resilient uh, this planting um, has has been. Anyway, they've got a new gardener, and I believe Nigel will be extending the work uh, sometime this uh, this winter. Um, my own last garden in Herefordshire in England, um, spontaneous species, one of the things I enjoyed doing was just seeing how far I can go with letting in cow parsley, um, which was um, something that I'm glad to see quite a few other people have been doing as, as well, about how you blur the boundaries between the designed space and uh, nature, um, allowing in certain uh, certain wild species you know you have to make that assessment about you know how likely is this uh, going to be something that i can actually manage that isn't going to involve it isn't going to um isn't going to uh, in, engulf what i actually want um the cow parsley the anthriscus sylvestris as being a, a pretty short-lived plant with a very physically very narrow profile and effectively summer dormant is is a nice example of something that we can probably be actually pretty secure in the, knowing that it can be an, an addition and and not um, have a deleterious effect. Um, a very dear colleague, Catherine Jansen, in in uh, a near neighbour in Herefordshire, uh, was doing something um, similar. Um, and this was a garden that I was very pleased to put in the book I did with with, with Claire. Um, it's um, a, a relatively small garden, incredibly densely planted. Um, you know, everything has its place. And um, I suppose it's the, the confidence of someone who really knows her plants to be able to put things so densely that it really does almost approach that of a, of a wild plant uh, uh, community that... You know, every single ecological there's every single ecological niche um is filled in the way that you know so much planting leaves uh, a lot of ecological niches unfilled um and if you look um kind of sideways on uh this is a you know a good way of of appreciating this and just seeing what kind of plant density there is at um at ground level Um, architecture, uh, by which I mean uh, the shape and form and, and uh, structure of, of plants, and uh, which um, um, is something that is um, it's often one of those things that we deal with intuitively, um, and that perhaps the reason that some people are better at putting together plants than others is this intuitive awareness of how plants will fill space uh, and mesh together over over time. Um, this is a garden by Alejandra O'Neill uh, in Cap d'Antibes in the south of France, um, again shot by Claire, a Mediterranean climate garden that I think achieves this, a very wild look um, through a certain amount of judicious pruning, but, but above all, uh, a, a, I think a real awareness of, of plant architecture. Um, so actually, um, this is one of those areas where I think we need to articulate more. We need to look more analytically at what we mean by plant architecture at plant form uh, and perhaps try to, well, I've tried to make a start on this, but try to systematize it as a way of uh, making uh, designers and planting people more aware of how they put plants together. Um, so it was a great opportunity to work with Warsaw City Council a few years ago um, on a um on a planting design course where we very much made this a, a focus of working with uh with with plant plant architecture uh so this is an area i think we could do with a lot more kind of analytics and thinking about uh how we actually do make that those physical connections between plants through the through the growing season um, as an example of that, uh, I think these are photographs taken in, in Hermanshof in, in, in July. Um, the purple here being Caliroe or Involucrata, one of those plants that grow it on its own. It's just it looks horribly kind of messy, sprawly, really, um, really very unattractive apart from those magenta flowers. Grow it through something else like Baptisia australis um, and it all comes together. There's a lot of plants we grow that 
if you think about it, you know, na in nature, plants are growing so close together, so cheek by jowl. And in horticulture, we have all these spaces between plants. You know, even in a Pete Aldoff garden, there's a lot of spaces between plants. So intermingling and really understanding that architect enables us to give in Caliroa in Voluquata what it needs, which is the support of another plant, and a way of spicing up uh, Baptisia australis after it's finished flowering. Uh, Potentella nepolensis, another messy, sprawly plant uh, that the conventional sources of garden wisdom um, rather rather denounce. Give it something nice and solid like uh, Lithum vergatum, um, then um, uh, it, uh, it it's, has support and the this understanding of how plants grow together naturally will create a much better effect. Um, Le Jardin de Béchigrange in Alsace uh, has always been a real favourite, and it was great that Claire was able to get there to photograph for the book. Um, we have uh, done a Garden Masterclass feature on this. Uh, thanks very much to Joanne Gletley, who uh, handled the filming and, uh, and translation. It's somewhere I'd very much like to go back there. I think this is a garden where we've, we've got an enormous amount to, to learn about uh, well, in this instance, putting together uh, non-natives, mostly North American grassland prairie species, into um, a, uh, a West European rough grass meadow. Um, a lot, uh, a nice example of, of a garden that has really taken uh, ecological planting to to to, to a real ex extreme, and, and those places are you know, very important ones too. Um, to learn from. Uh, which brings me on to uh, our extraordinary lack of awareness about what goes on underground. Um, we're always digging plants up to move them around uh, or when we when we plant out and if we've been in the nursery business we'll know a lot about you know, how to divide plants, um, a lot of that kind of intuitive knowledge. Um, but really the the if you actually look through reference books or look online, the number of pictures of root or rhizome systems you can find is absolutely minimal. Um, a real uh, lack of awareness about terms. I mean, the RHS, even the RHS can't always seem to really agree on what a rhizome is or isn't. Um, looking through RHS um trials reports and you know, a remarkably little awareness of you know the long-term performance of plants or, or or what's which is very often driven by what goes on underground um so uh, i was delighted a few years ago to come across this extraordinary archive of botanical art in poznan in poland by a surrealist photographer turned botanical artist fortunata obropalska who worked with Professor Alexander Wukasiewicz, um, who I think is the only person who's ever come up with um, a, a, a really coherent, systematic way of understanding perennial growth. And this has been of, of huge interest to me and uh, very much part of the online plant directory I'm hoping to launch this spring. Um, really great to have... Um, uh, a, a clear methodology of of, of looking at plants, uh, looking at perennials in terms of underground structures driving um, their spread or indeed their lack of spread. Um, and their, um, if you understand what goes on underground, you'll have a much better understanding of, of how a plant will occupy space uh, over time, which is crucial to any planting, but to ecological planting in particular. And thanks very much to Margosha Kidrinska, who's been a fantastic uh, help with all of this. Um, and um, it's great to be able to come across these uh, these academic uh, sources of knowledge and um, really try to bring them to a wider public, uh, because there's, there's so much to learn here. Now, what about woody plants? Um, I think this has been an increasing drum roll over the last few years. You know, looking back to that period in the mid 90s when we were all getting terribly excited about German parks and about uh, Dutch Hain parks and, and Pete Aldorf and all the rest of it, it was as if we'd we were developing this new movement in ecological or naturalistic planting does design on the one hand and rediscovering herbaceous perennials on the other, and the two kind of went together in concert. 
And if the, 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 the tape recorder of history were played differently, perhaps that wouldn't have happened. And we would have worked a lot more with woody plants right from the beginning. But I think the, the lack of interest in using woody plants um, in many so-called naturalistic designs or many perennial designs over the last 20 or so years has been really very unfortunate. Um, so, and in terms of biodiversity, uh, the research such as the Bugs Project in Sheffield um, with um, um, uh, Ken Thompson and, and his team has shown very, very clearly is that woody plants play an absolutely crucial role in building high biodiversity environments. Uh, so, um, Wildside in Devon again, uh, where there is really good integration of woody plants and 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 shaping shrubs and and manipulating shrubs in ways that help you manage space, so that you can you you build up uh, an evolving picture in in, in a garden that uh, very often allows you to appreciate perennials better uh, through through using woody plants to to frame or to shade or create glades. Um, there's so much more here we we need to experiment with and, and discover. Um, the New York Highland does this um, in many ways. I, I do feel that this has been my, this is actually my favourite Peter Adolf planting. Actually, it's kind of radically more diverse than anything else he's done. There's a lot of intermingling. There's quite a lot of ecological process, um, and um, it's that at times that kind of interweaving of, of woody and perennial is is often done very very uh, successfully and in some ways i think this is the most wild looking of of anything he's he's done um you know it's these very species rich ground floor uh beneath the woody plants i think is something that is especially uh, important lesson um gray to green um in uh, sheffield um wonderful example of the application on a large scale uh, and within um you know fairly serious financial constraints of what we've been doing i went there in the in the summer and quite um methodically along with my video my new my new iphone uh, recorded a lot of this um on, on video and i must say i was absolutely astonished at the um very high level of this how good it was looking um, I can't remember now, and I hope someone will be able to tell me just how many hours staff time per year are spent per square metre here. It is actually pretty low. Um, and there's there's hardly any of it that looks a mess or hardly any of it where one particular plant has, has, has taken over. Um, uh, Hermanshof in Germany, I've mentioned uh, before, uh, truly remarkable garden. Um, and I, it's obviously suffered a great blow this year with... Um, Cassian Schmidt uh, no longer being uh, being director there, and we hope that this um, this amazing garden will be able to continue to be an an, an inspiration. But I think what this is showing, I think what Hermann show, shows supremely well, is how you know, native and non-native species can be brought together. It's a great example of the kind of new nature that. Uh, in many places with climate change um, and I think a greater awareness of wanting to use particular plants for conservation purposes uh, we we need to be we need to be looking at I, I would argue very much that the future will involve looking at artificial ecosystems bringing plants together uh, because they uh, will perform well within a particular ecology rather than simply where they are from geographically uh, that uh, to to make uh, to make plantings that are uh, that are sustainable, maintainable, uh, long term, uh, as well as supporting biodiversity, as well as looking good, and that those benefits to biodi those benefits to biodiversity uh, will in it has become now well established in, and indeed well established in many gardening cultures as something that uh, is, a, is, if not a priority, then at least an important factor to consider. And certainly within my gardening lifetime of 40 odd years or so, um, this has been perhaps one of the, the, the greatest achievements. We also need to look at what benefits ecosystem stability. Um, is there a particular proportions of, of plants or types of plants that create more stable ecosystems? Can single species play a particular role here? Uh, I always remember 
uh, is it Christine Slater at um, New York Botanic Gardens uh, talking to me about sporobolizing, using sporobolus heterolepis in plantings to uh, to effectively bring uh, stability. Um, you know, some of these cespitose grasses, for example, uh, may be able to be like a matrix, uh, which uh, which in other plants will coexist with to uh, enhance stability. Uh, crucially, aesthetics, what we want to see and what the general public want to see. What about what we want to eat? Um, we've become a lot more aware over the last few years of how many garden plants uh, we can we can eat um, daylilies, hostas, persicarias. Um, I've you know thrown all sorts of things into the wok, um, and um, uh, increasingly in uh, the climate change future, where every planting we have to, we do has to serve so many different stakeholders, people, people's aesthetics, uh, environmental services, biodiversity. Um, probably foraging as well. And crucially, what we need to conserve, uh, I would argue that we should be looking at sp threatened species, um, particularly species that will be threatened by loss of habitat and climate change, and looking at how we can use those in planting design, you know, whether or not they are particularly beautiful or not. Um, that may be one of the, 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 the most important uh, ethical issues we have to face in the planting of, of the future. Um, I'm just going to end with a very quick rattle through a favourite garden, uh, Oakwood, uh, Wisley, the oldest planting on ecological principles I know of, around about 120 years old, very much William Robinson inspired. Um, we've had you know, over a century of fairly low touch uh, maintenance um, and uh, we've in fact, interviewed the new uh, managed garden manager here, Jack Aldridge, um, a few months ago, um, a wonderful mix of native and non-native species um, and a lot of exotic shrubs, but, you know, a huge amount of ecological process going on in a really interesting place just to look at this tapestry of plants uh, on the uh, on the woodland floor. Um, and it's um, I very much uh, hope that in you know, future years, the RHS will be able to continue to manage it in this very sort of light touch uh, way, which is creating you know, very high species counts per uh, square meter. So uh, just ending on that final thought that we should be looking in the future very much as planting as nature conservation. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Kingsbury. Thank you, Ms. Gilfoyle, for hosting um, me. Noel, could you elaborate a bit more about your plant research database? Because yes. pe people that you people who are on our mailing list, um, you mentioned it and you asked people yes, to yes. write in, but but people who might be tuned in tonight who are not on the mailing list, do you want to just elaborate? But yeah, I mean basically, you know, we've got shelves, loads of reference books, many of them very good. There's got a lot of stuff online. So often it doesn't tell you what you really want to know if you are a, a garden designer or landscape architect. How long is something going to live? How much is it going to spread? How much is it going to seed? You know, all of those what I call long term performance issues are really, really important, um, as well as the kind of um, vagueness about cultivars. And there are so many cultivars of so many species. Um, and, you know, there's often very little information on, you know, which are the really good ones and again coming back to business a real lack of awareness of what goes on underground so i've been working on this um essentially as sort of like a plant directory that really focuses on these performance issues my intention is to make that an online resource and something that will actually become collaborative i'm very much looking uh, to have other people you know contribute data contribute photographs uh continue opinion contribute opinions uh, so we can build up something that uh, would be under the garden masterclass umbrella, some sort of subscription model where people could have access to information about that makes you think, well, what's it going to be looking like in five years or, or 10 years time? Um, and I mentioned those um, botanical art in, in Poland, but today I have had the utter joy of this um, daughter of a couple we know here in Portugal who 
our um, run a small nursery. And this young woman um, is a self-taught botanical artist. And her work, I just think, is incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, I invited her over for a day to come and draw some plants from the garden and just astonished at what she's done. Um, and she's going to be doing a, a three-year apprenticeship at Hamburg Botanical Gardens and starting in the summer. Um, and I think she might be, um, well, digging quite a few things up and drawing them. And <laughs> really wonderful to have somebody who can um, do such wonderful work on those parts of the plants we don't normally see. Well, that's good. Um, into a couple of comments. Um, yes. Stephen Medley says, brilliant session, more like this, please. And actually, it did occur to me, we've got a nice big full house tonight. Yes. Um, while, while we've got such a nice big full house, we would love you to suggest um, both Thursday Garden uh, chat topics, but also webinar topics. I mean, I think this was really a webinar, Noel. I think you've been very generous with all of this. <clears throat> but... Um, so, you know, please do email us and say we'd love to hear such and such or we need more about so and so because we, you know, we really value that. And if we can make it happen, we will. So um, and then Mark's asked. What's wrong with Annabelle? Don't get him started. Don't get him started. Oh, Noel yeah. and I'm going to buy Noel a nice big hydrangea Annabelle. For you know, I, 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 we have one in the garden because Joe <laughs> likes it. <laughs> so I've been watching that gun and thing last summer. <laughs> um, no, I mean the thing about and Annabelle, it's you know it's, it's sterile head, so it does nothing for pollinators. Um, you know, nothing in our part of the world eats it. And I think what I really object to it is is the way that it's used, kind of en masse. I mean, just to have the odd one, the odd white blob in amongst other plants, fine. I've got no big problem with it. But it's when you know an entire planting is done with it and it does unlike most hydrangeas it does not die elegantly you know most hydrangeas kind of fade not 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 annabelle mm -hmm. which which i'm oh i'm trying desperately not to talk about what we've got coming up but we've got a live event which will be a really good hydrangea eye-opening mm. wonderful day so more to be revealed um there is a question oh it's gone it's why do the question oh yeah um Teresa's asking, can you recommend reading materials or a book um, uh, that can get you started in putting together planting designs as dynamic plantings with potentially some combinations uh, to get started that are not prairie planting? Yeah, I mean. Um, and what about your book? Your um, Where is it? Your book with, uh, with Pete? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the last book I did with Pete, the last, you know, the last kind of um, okay. garden a garden book yeah planting a, a new perspective now we tried to do that there we began to look at that territory there and we managed to pack a lot of information in the table at the back but i mean crucially perhaps 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 read some plant ecology um it's a wonderful book um if you can get hold of it actually called j philip grime now j philip grime was a researcher at sheffield university in the 1980s 1970s 1980s who developed the whole competitor stress tolerant ruderal system which has been a lot of people in a lot of places have found that really really useful yeah, um, yeah there's that book thank you annie um well yeah but you see no the good thing about this book yeah, and that yeah. I, no other books do is that there is a table in here that tells you about long-term life performance yes. short-term life com yeah, com yeah. Com competitive you know yes, that's, that's yes. what's so brilliant about it uh, yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah, no, I think that's uh, we're basically I'm trying to take that territory with the online plant directory and take that further. But yeah, but J. J. Philip Grime, um, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the book now. Um, it's one of those books that's horribly expensive secondhand, but the the first edition is now available for free digitally. Um, and I read it. It's one of those one of those academic books that's actually quite easy to read. I mean, if you understand about plants, that, that, that it will be, you know, a lot of us have found that whole approach hugely informative. And it's kind of really making you think about, I mean, it's all about wild vegetation, but it makes you think very much about how vegetation kind of works and therefore how a designed vegetation <laughs> could, could work. Um so I will I'll put the um 
the name up in on when we put this up on YouTube. I'll put it on the on the blurb in YouTube. His name comes up a lot with a lot of our. It does, yes. I mean, he was. I mean, he did. He was never had any formal connection with James Hitchmore or Nigel Dunnett, but the very fact that you know they were at Sheffield, oh, wow. um, and you know, they were very much, I think, pulling in his you know, drawing on his on his work. So um, Jen Jenny Price Nelson wants uh, is, has a question: How can we get municipalities to understand the cost of monoculture failure, thus justifying yes, yes. ecological planting by cost? Is there research you're aware of that shows financial benefits of these types of planting? Um, not that I'm aware of that anyone's kind of put together. Uh, it really desperately needs to be done, some international survey here. Um, what about Cassian? Um, Wouldn't Cassian have done some? Well, see, Cassian, Cassian at Hermans Holt, <clears throat> his staff time was all logged so that um, he could say at the end of every year how many staff hours per square metre. Yeah. But they, those were all uh, intermingled planting. They didn't have any control. They didn't have any control. They did, they weren't comparing with okay. blocks of Annabelle or blocks of petunias or whatever right. other nasties people might. Claire, Claire Foster's asking, Noel, what's your view on changing a garden soil or substrate to inc increase biodiversity, i.e. planting in sand or crushed concrete? Well, I mean, this is a difficult one. I mean, if you've got a perfectly good soil, why would you want to dump a whole load of... Mm -hmm demolition waste on top of it to create a biodiverse planting. Um, I think that that's a very valid question. So we've got clapping from South Carolina there. Um, <laughs> but personally, I, mean, I, I think one of the very crucial um, sort of doctrines, if I could almost use that word, from the 1990s with the whole movement was that, you know, we should be working with the environment we have, <laughs> not yeah. trying to change the environment to suit the plants we want to grow. Um, and the, yeah, that taken board totally that point about you know low fertility substrates do support higher biodiversity, um, but then you know do we you know, good quality soil, good quality fertile soil is something precious, and we should be making the most of that. And and that yeah, there will be things that grow, and perhaps there will be less diversity, but um, well, it all comes down to the sustainability of, and desirability of carting large quantities of. of materials around and uh, we also have to think about you know future uses mm -hmm. yeah. that a good fertile soil might be absolutely at a premium in a climate change future and there yeah. will be enough in post-industrial wastelands to have higher di biodiversity um you know, post demolition stuff on so yeah so everybody's been doing their homework so beatrice has found plant strategies and vegetarian oh, uh, vegetation vegetation yeah, processes Thank you, beatrice. by jp grime and then stephanie's found it for a snip at 247 pounds on amazon but the first edition is definitely available online and also somebody was telling me the other day that there's va that there's various ways of us there's there's an awful lot of books that are available digitally um that uh in in libraries that can be electronically borrowed okay and beatrice has also put a um a link in the chat box which if you want to go to that link and have a look before we close it down um it's to ibiro ibiro libro.com www.ibiro libro.com but if anybody wants to click on that link you can before we mm. we finish um and you mentioned ken thompson we do need to get ken thompson on um, we do we do we've had him on once but no great great myth buster great <laughs> yes yes definitely definitely um don't get him started on permaculture <laughs> like don't get you started on hydrangea annabelle <laughs> or a lot of other things get you started on <laughs> <laughs> oh calirowi is it hardy in the uk um it should be is it? Hello. I don't know. Um, I mean, it it's grows. Pretty short, it's pretty short-lived, anyway. Like a lot of these malvaceous. Okay. I mean, it, it looks amazing at Chanticleer yeah. in, the, in the gravel garden, scrabbling. Yeah, on. yeah. But but uh, Lisa does have to edit it very carefully. Um, it seeds a lot, does it? Yeah, and and it scrabbles and it. But, but I mean, she edits it so it does look really beautiful. But it's that shot of magenta. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. But I then you know. I don't know. I mean, is it? I don't. I haven't seen it in the UK. I don't know if anyone else has. I've never seen. It. I've, I've and I've grown it here in Portugal, and I don't there know. Must be, it must be a reason, mustn't there? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Dr. Kingsbury. That was a, a marvelous talk.
<laughs> we'll Again, have you back. Gonna... We will have you back. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you've you've passed your test. We'll have you back. <laughs> no, it's brilliant. But please, everybody who who's um, tuning in, do send us emails with suggestions. We'd love to know topics, people. You know, for online or for live events. You know, we'd yeah. we'd we're very happy to try and make things happen. If um, yes, yes, you know. yes, yeah, yeah, great, great, well, lovely. Well, good, lovely to see so many people and um, thank you Noel and uh, thank you for that suggestion Wendy it's I only drink G, G and T in the summer oh R <laughs> Wendy G and T is for every <laughs> night every night at six o'clock Wendy certain people, certain people made G and T but... <laughs> every night it's, it's two you have two in the summer one in the winter that's that's the deal <laughs> oh lovely great. Well, really right. nice to see you all great to yeah. see some good friends and dear colleagues in, in the audience great Thanks, Great. Noel. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone.